Um, just briefly, I'm a principal consultant with CSA Global, based in Perth. They've been in business for over 30 years. They're mining industry consultants and uh, have a presence around the globe with the biggest offices in Perth and in the UK. And uh, CSA has a broad range of technical expertise covering um, from project generation through to mine closure with all the, what goes in between. All right, let's have a quick look at lithium. I'm gonna tackle lithium first and then uh, graphite afterwards. Historical production figures, these are from the USGS. And you can see there that um, from the 1950s, um, lithium mineral production was, and lithium compounds was 0.1 of a million tons. It's now grown up to over 0.6 of a million tons two or three years ago. And it includes a wide range of different minerals and compounds. But you can see there a very steep growth from about 2000 onwards. And if we have a look in detail, and I know this is a really detailed table, but really what I wanted to do was highlight the fact that there's a heap of different uh, compounds and minerals that are used in the lithium market. And Australia's dominant position in spodumene from pegmatite, having doubled over the, that period. And also Chile is another big producer, having uh, doubled their production of lithium carbonate over that period. Um, a complex uh, market. And we saw this graph earlier, but really what it highlights is that ceramics, glass, and uh, rechargeable batteries account for two-thirds of um, lithium consumption globally. And the growth um, that people are talking about is into batteries. And if we just look at the uh, historical situation, we can see there that as a percentage of um, total lithium market, batteries accounted for 17% in 2008 and it's now grown to 35% of the total lithium market by 2014. So that's a real trend upwards, and in fact the total lithium carbonate equivalent market also went up by an average of 7.1% uh, compound annual growth rate, compared with the batteries that grew at 21.5%. And this is just from uh, a company called Storm Crow that forecasts that rechargeable batteries, ceramics and glass, would have these sort of increases big tonnage increases, uh, bringing it up to over 400,000 tons of lithium carbonate equivalent altogether. And where is lithium produced? This is a map um, from a paper that uh, reported on lithium resources worldwide. There's three main types of lithium deposits. Shown in blue are brines, of which the biggest producers are in South America, mainly in Chile and in China and up there, so that's salty water that's got lithium in, that the lithium's produced by evaporation. A second type of these sedimentary deposits shown up there, that's Rio Tinto's Jada deposit, as well as a lot of volcanic ash up in North America, they're not yet in production. And then the red dots are pegmatites, which are hard rock deposits related to granite, and the biggest producer in the world at green bushes south of Perth. And uh, just a graph to summarize that, in fact, the biggest producers, are Chile and Australia, account for nearly three quarters of global production. And what do lithium minerals look like? I'm going to focus on lithium minerals because that's an area I'm familiar with. And uh, it's a lot of interest in this part of the world. And uh, I'd just like to refer to this paper that we published recently. It came out a week or two ago in the AIG journal. Um, to do with reporting of lithium pegmatites. You might find it a useful reference, and I've re used some of the information from this uh, paper. And this looks like a really complicated table, which it is, but all I wanted to do was highlight some of the minerals. There's hundreds of lithium minerals. The two main ones are spodumene and petalite. They're lithium aluminium silicates, but you'll see there's a wide range of compositions for the different minerals, and also a wide range of Li2O. So these all have impacts on where they're going to be used in the markets and the market economics. This slide, uh, courtesy of Pioneer Resources, who have a project in uh, Canada, Canada um, just showing the difference in spodumene. It doesn't all look the same. Those laths over there are spodumene as well as these green things. Different shape, different colors, probably different chemistry, maybe different markets they end up in. Here's something from Zimbabwe from, um, showing some pink petalite. 
and you can see the general sort of granitic composition, the look, very coarse-grained. Looking under the microscope, just wanted to highlight that not all pigmentites are created equal. And if we have a look there, that's a distinct um, spodumene crystal, about a millimetre in, in diameter, and you could imagine that that would be reasonably easy to extract. However, sometimes you get this sort of thing, quite often, um, where the spodumene is intergrown, that's quartz, and that's spodumene up there. Could be quite difficult to extract, have a look at the scale. And you can also get petalite, which is shown in yellow in the microscope image, with small veins of spodumene and quartz intergrowth that have formed by alteration around these petalites. So all of these things impact on markets where the project might go to. So to sum up, there are numerous lithium-bearing minerals in pegmatites. There's a range of compositions within deposits and between different deposits, so they're not all the same. Some markets, may such as glass, may require very low iron content. That's something else that needs to be taken into account. Different minerals will produce different concentrates. Petalite ca cannot produce more than a 4.5% Li2O concentrate, typically around about 4% where spodumene would typically be between 5 and 6.5 or even 7%. So the economics are fairly different. If we look at the next line here, you're going to get a lot less lithium products downstream out of a lower concentrate petalite, which might also work. Petalite might be really good for glass, for example. And just finally, that petalite is often altered to a mixture of spodumene and quartz, which may make life difficult for extraction. <coughs> Coming on to graphite... Uh, just referring to this um, graphite outlook thing that we uh, published last year, some of the uh, information comes from there. Uh, USGS, global graphite um, production, around about a couple of hundred thousand tons in the 50s and increasing quite rapidly at over 3% um, compound annual growth rate up until now to more than 1.2 million tons. That's natural graphite, excluding synthetic. Where is graphite used? Most of it's used in iron and steel manufacture and refractories, and then the growing battery market. And what type of graphite is used? If we take the total production of 1.2 million tons, of which China contributes three quarters, followed by Brazil, and then I suspect North Korea next, and then a few others down there, Amorphous graphite, which I'll show you a picture of later, is 0.3 of a million tons, so that's a quarter of the total. Flake graphite, a lot more. And then a very small amount of the specialized vein graphite. It's a few thousand tons a year. There's often confusion about amorphous versus flake in the market. I'm sticking amorphous strictly to metamorphosed coal, not just f very fine flakes. So what's driving growth? Batteries, again. And we can see the forecast for spherical graphite that is manufactured from flake graphite at about 50,000 tons a year at the moment. Various people are forecasting. This is a company called uh, Pro Graphite, reported by Kabaran Resources, is expecting um, by 2025 that it will go up to somewhere towards 200,000 tons of uh, spherical graphite. That's going to probably need at least 400,000 tons of flake graphite to produce that, which is half the current world production. What does natural graphite look like? That just looks like coal. So that is metamorphosed coal. It happens to come from Austria. Then we have uh, a sample of flake graphite, just to show you the difference. I just wanted to get a feel for the different look of these things. This is a very high-grade sample of about 25% flake graphite from an underground mine in Germany. And those are the flakes of graphite there. Typically, the mines uh, produce, run at about 5 to 10% open cost. And if we have a look under the microscope, all I wanted to do was highlight that that's a Mozambique example with a nice big thick long flake. That's a producing Chinese um, operation. Thinner flakes, also long but thin. So one would intuitively expect different markets for these different products. And that's between two different continents. And if we take one project, which is Graphics Mining's Chilalo project in Tanzania, They've defined a high-grade core and then a lower-grade halo around it. And we can see they're both at the same scale, the tremendous difference in the morphology of the flakes. 
long and thin, long and very fat, nearly a millimeter wide. And again, one would expect differences in how the stuff performs in the market. And then vein graphite, which is really interesting stuff. That's a vein from a prospect um, in Sri Lanka. Uh, this is vein graphite on either side of a piece of granite uh, from a producing mine in uh, Sri Lanka. That's known as um, needle graphite. You can see it's little needle-shaped graphite crystals. And then from the same mine, some high purity, massive vein graphite. Now, I'd quickly like to have a look at which markets these different graphites go into and why they do. So why do people use amorphous graphite, that metamorphosed coal? Those are just some of the products that it can, uh, can be made from it. One of the reasons for using amorphous graphite, certainly in the conventional market, is the low price. Um, the graphite content's normally about, or carbon content's normally in the 80s, so it is lower than some of the other ones, but it has the advantage of a low price. It's also used as a fuel during desulfurization of um, steel, and they use those um, graphite briquettes shown at the bottom there. And then amorphous graphite, another interesting thing is it's actually less reflective, so a little bit darker than some of the silvery graphite like the flake graphite. And therefore it can be used in coatings or when you want to make pencils have a darker color. You'd use some of that metamorphosed coal. Why do we use flake graphite? And what's its special niche that's gonna grow? You can make high purity flake graphite with very little chemical purification if you have the right project or right deposit. Flakes are flexible and can be made into spheres or rolled up into like small potatoes. This is just an ex example from a uh, recent uh, report by Kabaran Resources. Those are about 10 microns across, they're little spherical rolled up flakes of graphite. And that on the left is a plant in China, that's how they make these things. Um, flakes can also be, have other molecules intercalated between them and then become expandable graphite. When you heat it up, it expands very rapidly. And that's shown on the right there. So these are specific areas where flake graphite works and amorphous most likely, well, wouldn't, and vein graphite probably wouldn't either. And then if we go to vein graphite at the bottom, you can see that's brush carbon brushes from an electric motor. The vein graphite is mass massive or sort of isotropic, it's not flaky. Sometimes it's easier to mix into formulations because of its shape, even when it's been milled up. Naturally, they, well, they, it's got high purity, but they hand sort this material. So there are some end users that would like no chemical residue from flotation or chemical processing. In that case, vein graphite um, has a unique position. Because of its shape, compared with flake graphite, it actually has different electrical and thermal behavior because it's isotropic or has the same properties in all directions compared with anisotropic flake graphite. It's softer and smoother, so people, especially in luxury motor cars, will use these brushes in the, um, where the brushes rub against the commutator in uh, servo motors for um, windscreen wiper motors and window winders. And then something really interesting is if you have um, some of this uh, vein graphite that may have a little bit of quartz in it that you'd normally think is really bad to have an impurity. In fact, it's quite good because the little bit of impurity, if you get it just right, actually helps with cleaning the commutator that otherwise builds up dirt on it. So you don't always have to have highly pure graphite. A couple of conclusions. Markets and drivers, there's two dominant markets. You've all heard about them, batteries, glass, and ceramics two-thirds of the lithium market globally, and they're both growing. And remember glass, we shouldn't forget that glass is used on uh, smartphones and a lot of other applications where they need tough glass, and lithium's a really important component of that. And people have been forecasting the li lithium market, that's just lithium carbonate equivalent there, is gonna grow by more than double over the next nine years or so. Important takeaway is not all lithium deposits are created equal. Dominated by two sources, brines, the salty water, and pegmatites, the hard rock, and each pegmatite is different. 
and they can be complex mineralogy. You can even find in, within one sort of deposit that different pigment sites have different mineralogy and would have different markets that they're going to. The lithium minerals themselves vary in size and purity, and markets may demand different lithium minerals based on that. For example, the glass industry that needs very low iron. And a couple of conclusions about natural graphite. At the moment, is one dominant market, refractories and steel. And we need to remember refractories don't only go into steel, it does also go into cement manufacture and other things that need furnaces. So that includes glass as, as well. Refractories and steel are declining. As plants become more efficient, they use less refractories, so the consumption per tonne of steel is going down. Um, and just by the way, um, amorphous graphite from China has been replaced in Japan in some cases by anthracite because they could uh, get it cheaper. There was a time when the price of amorphous graphite went up through the roof in uh, China. And we're expecting battery and expandable graphite uh, market growth. Again, not all graphite deposits are created equal. We have a number of variations in the morphology of the graphite. And markets may demand different shape of graphite, purity, and or sizing. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank CSA Global and the companies that have helped me out with the various photos there. Thank you very much.